It's all good. Amen. How many of you are glad to be in the house today? I am happy to be in the house of God. I am thrilled to be in the house of God. Um, and uh, even with the message uh, this morning, uh, just uh, feeling the anointing, I, I feel that the uh, Lord is a word uh, for new life, our church, and not only for new life, but I really believe for the churches, you know, the body of Christ, not only in this nation, but, uh, you know, in the world, really. Um, I was so stirred up when Pastor Giselle started speaking into the lead pastors of all the New Life churches. We were having a meeting, and he spoke about, uh, you know, what he saw. Uh, how many of you remember what the watchword of the year is? Afa, thank you very much. So what is the watchword of the year? Higher, higher. That's the watchword of the year. Obviously, coming into the second half of the year of higher, obviously, we were asking the Lord, Lord, what's next? You know, there's more for us that you want to see. And one of the things that Pastor Giselle was sharing was about the church, what he sees for the church. And we were stirred up with a healing summit. We had our healing summit, June 11. Amazing testimonies. You're going to be hearing all of them later on at the end of the service. But miracles, signs and wonders, bodies being healed. And then, of course, last week as Pastor Edwin preached an amazing word on loving this nation. And one of, the re, uh, uh, one of the ways that we can love this nation is to help build local churches in this nation that, you know, we believe that the believers in this nation must be the primary movers of this nation, of course, of course. And so even in asking, what does higher look like for this church and for those who are planted here? Now, how many of you know when you're planted in your local church, you're planted there because God brought you there? God saw it fit to put you in that church because there's something in that church that you need to hear. There's something in this church that you need to receive. And so what I would ask you is, what have you seen in this year of hire and what else do you still want to see? You know, second half, second half of the year. And let me declare to you what I see, and that would be the title of my message if you're taking down notes, which we encourage you to do. The title of my message is The 24-7 Church. The 24-7 church. We're done with the this, 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 all right? So I just kind of broke that streak. I started the this streak, the title, and you know, um, right now the title is the 24-7 church. So let's go to Matthew 16, verse 17 to 19, the New King James Version. These are verses that you've heard over and over again for a reason, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So it says in verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my father is in heaven, the revelation being that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Amen. That was the revelation, you know, that Peter uh, declared. And he said, well, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, this rock of revelation, the rock on you know, the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, if God is building something, then it cannot just be limited to a once or twice a week gathering with a few thousand believers. How many of you know that? I mean, if God is building something, then I believe that its impact is far reaching spiritually, geographically. I mean, that's how God works, right? He, he's not limited at all. And I believe that all the wonderful and powerful, life-changing things that happen inside the church should be happening all over our city and all over our nation in greater measure and in greater frequency. And we cannot do that if we are limited to the four walls of this house. And I'm so glad that we are in an apostolic church Founded by our, our, our senior pastor, Pastor Paul Shadi Chase, the apostle and the prophet. <laughs> we are, you know, standing on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And, you know, we are an apostolic church and we're not limited. The reach of this church is not limited to the four walls of this church. And we have our NLCOM team who just arrived from Leyte right now, headed by uh, Pastor Paul and Heidi uh, Giaga. And, of course, with uh, Cam Bynum of the Minnesota Vikings. Come on. So, you know what? Uh, what did we do there? We just touched a city. Our church just touched a city that was beyond the four walls of this nation. Amen. And so as a church, that is what we must do. Why? Because the Greek word, and again, you've heard this over and over again, but faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The Greek word for church is? 
ecclesia or ecclesia or ecclesia or, you know, but a Greek word is ecclesia. What does that mean? It means a legislative assembly of selected people that were summoned for one purpose. So this was not the word church, which is ecclesia, was not a, a religious term. It was actually a governmental term, a, a political term. It was used all the time, introduced by the Greeks, for a group of people who have been summoned and gathered together to govern the affairs of a city. That's the church. So all of us here, we have been gathered. We have been summoned by God to actually direct, control, and influence the actions, the culture of the city and the nation that we are called to. That's the ecclesia. That's who we are. That's, that's huge. We were all called to actually control, direct, strongly influence the actions and conduct of a city and a nation. Yeah. Woo! Selah. So for Jesus to use this term, ecclesia, it meant that he was giving us the keys of governmental authority in his kingdom to the church, to his selected ones. So guess what? You hold keys. Some very powerful keys. What do keys do? They lock things and they unlock things. So if you continue to read Matthew 16, verse 19, he said to the ecclesia, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind or forbid on earth will be bound in heaven, or in the original translation, has already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose, release on earth, will have already been loosed in heaven. That's our role as the ecclesia. We bind and loose things. That's why we bind sickness and disease, and we lose healing. That's what we do. So the church, let me give you a bigger vision of what a church is. It is not just an institution, but it is a movement of transformational people making a difference wherever God has called them to be in the city. Whether you are a doctor, a lawyer, a business person, a student, a politician, a housewife, NFL players, you know, whatever you have been called to be and to do in the city, he has called you to make a difference there. Yes. So that in that place, you bind and release so that as it is in heaven, so it shall be on earth. Yes. And that happens 24 seven, not just once a week, not just twice a week, not just within your life group, not just within the four walls of this church, but every Every day of our lives where God is going to give us opportunities to touch people, to control and influence what goes on in our families, in our businesses, in our city, and in our nation. Amen. Do you know that we have the power to do that? Where is the power? The power is in the Word of God. The power is in the Spirit of God. So what do I see as a church? What does the leadership see? We see us moving higher from doing church once, twice, thrice a week to being the Ecclesia 24-7. All of you here, you are the church. This building is not the church. The reason this is called church is because you and I are here. So wherever you go, you are the church. Wherever you go, you bind, you lose, you decree, you say what goes on in your family. When there's, uh, when there's things that are happening in your family, division, uh, strife, uh, contention, you actually can dictate what goes on in your family. And you speak life to the family. And you speak the word of God over your family. Amen. It must be so to directly influence a city and a nation. Amen. So let me uh, bring you to Colossians 1.18. And I want to show you a very, um, uh, a very powerful principle. If you're going to walk as the ecclesia, the church, 24-7. Colossians 1.18, talking about Jesus, he said, And he is the head of the body, the church, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, say all things, that means in everything we do, so that in all things, he may have the preeminence. In all things, not just things in the church, but in everything that you do. So you might ask, well, how? How can he have preeminence in all things? 
in the ecclesia. So picture this, Jesus is the head, we are the body, the church. And then go with me to Psalms 133. I told you I was gonna give you a powerful principle in the word of God that's gonna help us be the ecclesia 24 seven. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down at the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, where there? For in unity, the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, how many of you know that when God commands something, it must happen? It must happen when God commanded light be, light came in the midst of chaos in the book of Genesis chapter one. So whenever God commands something, it must be so. So when God commands a blessing in unity, how many of you know that when we start being united, blessing starts flowing? And it must be so because if we are to be again, the 24 seven Ecclesia church, we must be a united church. United in love for God love for one another, love for our nation and its people, love for the things of God. That's what we must be gathered around. I know that we just finished, you know, a very divisive and contentious election. We did that. And I remember in the last few weeks post-election, ah, oh, the division and the strife. And we started coming against it because we knew it was the plan of the enemy to bring strife and division into the body of Christ. Why? You know why he does that? Because when he attacks the unity of a house, the unity of a church. He's not just getting friends to split up or, you know, friends to not be friends anymore. He's not just doing that. But he's disrupting flow, he's disrupting power, and he's disrupting purpose. That's what happens when it comes against the unity of something. And so let's just go into these verses. I'll go with it. it's just three verses, all right? So verse one says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good and how pleasant. Two adjectives right there. Now, how many of you know not everything that is good is pleasant? Like vegetables are good, but they might not be necessarily pleasant. Like Brussels sprouts or broccoli, they're good for you. They're not necessarily pleasant. So we kind of like butter things up and, you know, Pastor Heidi can tell you how to cook broccoli in such an amazing, beautiful way. All right. So, but, and not everything that is pleasant is good for you. Like, you know, eating a whole big chocolate cake is pleasant, but it's not good for you. Maybe one slice or watching Netflix until 4 a.m. is pleasant. That is not good for you. I can attest to that with eye bags and all that. And come against that in Jesus name. But it does say how good and how pleasant it is to dwell together for family, for brethren. How many of you know the church is a family? We are family. And God says it is not just good, but it is also pleasant that we all dwell together in unity. There is something about unity that promises the favor of God upon us. Dwelling and living in unity because unity is God's secret weapon to go higher. That is God's secret weapon. Mark chapter 3, verse 24 to 25 in the Amplified Classic. And if a kingdom is divided and rebelling against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided, split into factions and rebelling against itself, that house will not be able to last. And so sometimes when we see cracks, maybe in a church, in a business, in a family, when some things are not right, check for unity. Check for unity because somewhere, somehow, there's discord. Somewhere, somehow, there's offense. Somewhere, somehow, there's unforgiveness. And we cannot afford to have that in these last days. We can't. And we must come against it. You know, let me just speak to husbands and wives. You cannot afford to have discord between yourselves. Why? Because one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000. So can you imagine the power that the devil wants to like, that's why he wants to break up marriages. That's why he wants to break up families because he knows there is power in unity. So I would encourage you families, husbands and wives, pray for one another. When you start feeling tension and contentious, because I'm not saying you're never gonna fight. I'm not saying you're never gonna disagree. But when that happens, start saying, hmm, 
you know what? We're a team. We're a team, right? So what's going on here? And check for unity and, and, and understand that this is the enemy's way of bringing division into the home so that your house will not stand. Amen. A house divided has diminished capacity. And as a church, we cannot afford to not have the capacity to be able to be a blessing to our world. So we must check for unity. The divine test is seen in Matthew 18, 19 to 20. Look at Matthew 18, 19 to 20. Again, I say to you that if two believers, just two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind, in harmony, about anything that they ask within the will of God, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. That is the divine test. He's already saying, when you're united, I am with you. And anything that you ask according to my will, I will give it to you. Anybody want answered prayers in this house? So God is present in unity. Unity is a weapon. Amen? But... Whether it builds or destroys depends on what it is gathered around. That's the thing. That's the power of unity. It destroys in the example of the Tower of Babel. How many of you remember that? Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel, all right? It destroys because it is unity. I love this. Pastor Nash sent this to me. I added it into my notes. It is unity. The, tower, the, the story, the account of the Tower of Babel, Babel, it's unity built around man. It is unity for the wrong reasons. In Genesis 11, 5 to 7, we can see that God came. He went against this unity. Why? Because they were building a name for themselves. They were building a tower that they wanted it to reach to heaven. And they wanted to build a name for themselves. So he said, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed. The people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Oh, and that was for the wrong reason. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so he scattered them, and they couldn't understand one another, and that's why we have all these languages. But how many of you know? That in the new covenant, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down, tongues of fire, <laughs> and all the ones who were there, all 120, started to speak in other tongues. And how many of you know, he brought back the unity of our language as believers. So when we come together in prayer, we may not know how to pray for a certain thing with our understanding or with words. Maybe we, we, we can't put into words our prayers, but we can go, oh, and we can come together and start praying in tongues. And how many of you know we are united when we pray that way? And anything we ask, he said, I'm going to give it to them. So that's the power of praying in tongues. It brought back unity in the body of Christ. So an example, obviously, in Acts chapter 2, 1 to 4, of unity that builds Pentecost 50 days after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's called Pentecost. It says here, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with what? One accord in one place. Are we in one place? And I pray that we are in one accord. And it says here, what happened? Oh, I love one accord. Actually, it, I, I looked up the word one accord and it says, everybody at the same time or place together Assembled together with one passion, unanimous. There is power in unity. And suddenly, how many of you are expecting suddenlies in your life? And suddenly, there came a great sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. They were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So in Acts chapter 2, we can see there was language, purpose, unity built around God, dependent on the Spirit's power and ability to work in us and through us. I want the suddenlies of God in this house. I want higher demonstrations of His wisdom, His power, and His goodness in this house in the families represented here, in this nation. 
like Healing Summit. Oh my goodness, when we came together for Healing Summit and believed for healing of bodies and not just physical bodies, but of the mind, the soul, the spirit, broken hearts, emotions, anxiety, depression. And we prayed against all that and we were one. How many of you know we saw power? We saw power come down from heaven. And I, I said this in the morning service and I'll say it again, I cannot wait for LifeCon. I cannot wait for a life conference because just as it was titled, Just Like Heaven, I believe that when we are united together to lift up the young people in the house, oh, we must pray for our young people. We must pray for life con. July, June 29 to July 2. Those days, we must lift up our young people because our young people right now, they are so bombarded by the world system. They are so bombarded by what's going on around. And the world is speaking to them and the world is talking to them. This is how you must be. This is who you are. And this is what you must do. But you know what? The voice of the church needs to be louder. The voice of the church. I cannot wait for life gone. I cannot wait for the power of God to move in our life conference. And it will all come from unity when we are united. And verse 2. Unity. What is unity? It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. You stay united and the anointing will flow. How I many of you want the anointing? You want to stay anointed? Then you stay united. Amen. The whole body needs to be united. That's why the oil was not just upon the head. It wasn't just upon the beard. It just, it flowed, it flowed to the edges of his garment. I call that, as I heard one pastor say, oil on the fringes. The whole body needs to be anointed. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, all of them were gathered around presence. They were united around the presence of God. And that is what we must be gathered around. The ecclesia, the 24-7 church, must first be summoned around the presence of God before we are sent out into the world as the ecclesia. And the presence of God is realized in the anointing. That's where the presence of God is realized. What does anointing mean? Maybe some of you are saying, okay, what do you mean, pastor? What is anointing? It actually just, simply put, it just means to be smeared with. Smeared, like, you know, like if you have baby oil or sunblock lotion and you like smear yourself all over your face, your body, because you don't want the, you know, you don't want to get sunburned. That's just what anointing means. When you're anointed, you are actually uh, filled with the power of God. The anointing means it is God covering all of us with his power-filled presence. That's what he's doing. And supernatural things happen when we walk with his presence. So oil on the fringes, running down the edge of his garment. That is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. His actual presence upon not just the pastors, not just the leaders, but everyone in this room. Every believer is to be smeared with the anointing of God. Every believer is to be smeared with his actual presence. Why? Because when you are faced with impossibility, the covenant promise of God, which is, I will be with you, has always given us courage. Amen. Whenever we face something impossible, just those four words, I will be with you. I will be with you. Five. <laughs> just those five words, I will be with you has given mankind courage to pursue the impossible. He did it with Moses, and he did it with, um, with Joshua. You know, when Moses was like, how am I going to lead this people out of Israel? And God said, I will be with you. And he got a nation out of bondage. Joshua, this mighty military leader, was going to conquer a city and, you know, said, how am I going to do it? And what did, what did God say? Be strong, be very courageous. I am with you. And you might be thinking, well, that's Moses, pastor. That's Moses. That's Joshua. They were great, mighty men of God. Oh, really? Well, there's an example in the Bible. His name's Gideon. And Gideon was given an impossible task. He was asked to thwart like 10,000 Midianites with only 300 men. I mean, if you know, that's impossible in the natural. And Gideon, he was the least of his family, which was the least in the tribe, which was the least in Israel. So he was like, just right here in the bottom. And he felt insignificant and he was afraid and he felt cowardly. 
And how many of you here, you might feel that way sometimes. And you might say, how can God even use me? I'm insignificant. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a leader. I'm not this big shot person. But God chose Gideon, the least of the least of the least, to lead Israel into victory against the Midianites. Why? Judges 6, 14 to 16. Look at the account here. Then the Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And so he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? It must be a cry, God, that's not going to happen. Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. All it takes is one man to say yes. All it takes is one person to say yes to the will of God. And God can work mighty miracles in that one person's life. But I believe we are not just one man. We are the ecclesia. We are the church 24-7. And we are a church that said yes to the call of God on our lives. And in the New Testament, that is the mandate to all of us as believers. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, go, Ecclesia, go, my church, and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, this is the promise. I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. That is his promise, the promise of his anointing. And how many of you know that that promise is not just for our enjoyment? The church cannot hoard this anointing. Let me give you a principle in the Word of God. You get to keep only what you give away. Selah. Can I say that again? You get to keep only what you give away. Because as the ecclesia, we cannot have a hoarding mindset. Oh, I can't give this. I'm going to run out. Oh, I can't do this. You know what that is? That mindset does not believe can God, that God can provide. But see, when we believe that God can provide and He will provide because He is faithful and He is provider, we will have no problem when God says, I want you to go out and I want you to go forth and I want you to bless this city. I want you to bless this family. I want you to bless this nation. Hey, I want you to bless this employer. Hey, I want you to bless that person sitting at the far end. And you know what? That person, that person needs encouragement and you can go out. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about prayers. I'm talking about just, hey, how are you? Are you all right? Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And what do you do? You impart peace. You impart presence. You impart encouragement. That's what we do as the Ecclesia. Because all of you can go out into your homes, into your businesses, into your schools, and pray for people and give a word of encouragement, buy them coffee. You know, I remember just going out there and somebody was buying coffee and I was like, you know, and I, I was waiting uh, to pay, and they're like, here's my coffee, here's my coffee. And as soon as they paid, I said, sir, I got this. And I paid for it, I, like, Gcash is an amazing thing, right? <laughs> you know? And I did that, and you know what? Just the smile on that person's face, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I could do this all day. How I many of you know it's more blessed to give than to receive? We get to keep only what we give away. That's exactly what he said to the disciples in Matthew 10, verse 78. In the New King James Version, he said, and as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received. Like the 1130, come on. Freely you have received, freely give. Why? Because there's oil on the fringes. There's oil on the fringes, amen. The anointing equips us to bring the world into an encounter with God. That's why all of us must cry out, for more of the anointing. All of us, not just as a church, but even in your families. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be, you, 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 you. You will be my witnesses to tell people about me, both in Jerusalem, that was the church, Jerusalem, and in all Judea, maybe your neighbor, and Samaria, 
maybe your city, and even to the ends of the earth. That is the Ecclesia 24-7. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness, not just to witness, but to be a living, walking demonstration of the power of God 24-7. You are out there. Can you imagine that? You are out there 24-7, a walking, living demonstration of the power of God. That's why God wants you to experience his miracles. He just, he wants you to experience it and then he wants you to release it. He wants you to experience, he wants you to release. Identity check, this is not just what you do, this is who you are. This is a, who we are as a church. So my question is, is there oil on the fringe of this church? When the world touches the fringes of our church, do they touch the anointing? When they touch you do they feel the presence of God when they come to you are we the church 24 7 the woman with the issue of blood did not have to touch Jesus himself the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus's garment and all of a sudden all of a sudden power flowed out of Jesus and Jesus was like who who touched me can you imagine I see a church where each and every one of you are going out there and somebody touches you and they feel power, whether they are healed, whether they are encouraged, whether they, whatever it is, and they'll go, oh, what happened? And you are going to go, what happened? What happened there? The anointing from the head down flowed to you. You're going to clap, clap for Jesus. Because there's oil on the fringes of our church. Everyone is anointed. Everyone. Healing Summit, this is amazing. Because we had a, a, a lady in Healing Summit who, who could not talk. She couldn't talk. And uh, Kiko, you know, he said, all right, anybody who's sick here. So all the people who raised their hands sick. Okay, all those who are beside him, not the pastors, not the leaders, not the anointed ones. But those who are sitting behind him, I want you to lay your hands on, on that person who's raising their hand. So, and then he said, okay, so this is how we're going to do it. He said, I want you to ask them, right, the, 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 like, like, what, what, what the sickness, right? Okay, ask them, ask them now. So I said, so what are you sick with? So probably this person was like, what can I pray for for you? And, and, the, and the one who was beside her said, well, she, she can't talk. The one who was beside her can't talk. Okay, so instructions. And then, okay, did you ask? Did you ask? And then Kiko said, okay, now I want you to speak to that sickness. Command it to leave. Okay. And he said, make it short. I love that. It wasn't this long, drawn, oh, come on, out, out, out. No, it wasn't all that. Because sometimes we get so intimidated. How long do I have to pray before this person gets freed, right? I mean, Jesus with one word, come out, <laughs> right? And so he said, so we're like, okay, so I command this sickness to leave or whatever it was. And then he said, okay, that's it, that's it. That's enough, too long, too long. It's amazing. And then he said, then ask them now to do what they could not do. And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, testimony, one testimony, one woman came here. Okay, I know I don't have lumps in my breast anymore. One woman came here, the pain in my neck is gone. One girl who couldn't lift her hands because her lips would get blue was lifting her hands. Oh my goodness, all around. And that, that lady who's, uh, who could speak, she said, I couldn't speak and now I can speak. And we're like, ah, rejoicing. Do you know that the person who prayed for her was a new believer and it was her first time to pray for the sick? right? Everyone is anointed. So probably this woman who could speak, oh, I can speak. Oh, and maybe this girl who laid hands on her went, oh, oh. oh, I want those moments. I want those. Okay. You know, I know I'm anointed. I lay hands on the sick. And then they get healed and they go, ah, and then you go, ah. I see that in our church out there. Out there, not just here, but out there. Amen. Amen. Testimonies upon testimonies upon testimonies. Because we are the Ecclesia 24-7. Think about it. In the place that you graced your presence with, was it better when you left? Was somebody edified, encouraged? Did you leave your peace? Because we can impart peace into that house. Was someone enlightened? See, when we are united as a church and the anointing starts flowing because of it, 
we can have greater impact. We can have greater impact, particularly in our resources. And I mean, can you imagine a war-torn, let's just say a war-torn country, and you're like, I want to help this country, and it's war-torn, and you bring one bag of rice. How many of you know that can only go so far? But can you imagine if we're all united, all these resources come together, how we would touch a nation? Amen. 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 That's what we are, Ecclesia 24-7. And then the last verse, it says here, it is like the dew of Hermon, unity. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. And I'm ending right now, so if you could, uh, who is it? Is it Barb's coming in? So um, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore, dew from Hermon. Hermon is the highest peak in Israel. So it's like this picture of heaven bringing down the anointing upon the earth. In Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who does that? Who's going to make that happen? We, the church. We, the ecclesia. We get to dictate. We get to direct. We get to influence what goes on in our lives, our families, our businesses, our nations. It is where we speak His will, decree His will. And when we do that, we actually influence the course of a situation. Of a situation due from Hermon. We are the voice of God on the earth. We are the body. Amen. We are the hands of God. We are the feet of God. What does God need from us? He just needs a surrendered vessel to flow through. Ecclesia, I'm speaking to you. Can we be that surrendered vessel that God can flow through? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation not just the church, but the whole world. That's who we are. The vision of this house is making Jesus known by the power of his word, the presence of the Holy Spirit, changing people's lives. That is the vision of this house. And what I pray is that the vision of this house will also be your vision, that you would go out there making Jesus know by the power of his word and the presence of the Holy Spirit changing people's lives. That is what we are called to do as the Ecclesia. That is what we have been mandated to do. That is what God sees when he looks at the church. That is what Jesus sees when he looks at the church that he died for and gave his life for. I want to pray right now for each and every one of you, an activation right now, as I have declared that the anointing flows from the head down, and the anointing is going to flow right now from Jesus, the head of the church, and he's going to flow right now into this congregation, empowering you to be the ecclesia where God has planted you. So if you could, you know, if you have your two hands, and if you could hold them like this, just as a, you know, there's no religious thing to this. I mean, you know, it, 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 but I just kind of want a physical act. Yeah, a physical act, you know, of just receiving. No, nothing religious about it, but I just want that you have that physical act of receiving the anointing. I'm just going to pray for each and every one right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon each and every one of you here, the ecclesia, the church, that you would have a revelation of what you have been called to do, where God has placed you. Yes, you might be coming into this church, and yes, it is good that we come together and we receive from the Holy Spirit, and we hear words that edify us, that bring healing to us, and we hear words wherein in our circumstances, breakthroughs happen and healings happen. But what I pray is what we receive, we freely give when we go out the four walls of this church. And what I pray right now as you receive the anointing is that during the week, God would show you opportunities. He would show you people. While you pray, he, he will bring people into your mind and He will say, I want you to talk to that person. Oh, this person, I want you to bless that person. I want you to call him up. 
Hey, I want you to visit that person. Bring a bag of groceries to this person. Hey, that person needs encouragement. I want you to call that person and I want you to pray for him. That you're going to receive instructions like that in the name of Jesus because you are anointed because there is oil on the fringes. And if there are people that come in and say, oh, you know what? I've had a stomach ache for quite a while. You're not going to go, oh, let me call the pastor because the pastor might be asleep at that time. But you're there. And I declare that when you hear those things, you can say, well, can I pray for you? And you're just going to say, can I pray for you? Because you're not the healer. God is. So all we were commanded to do is to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. All we were commanded to do is to bring encouragement to people. And so I pray in the name of Jesus that that is exactly what you are going to do. And God would bring you opportunities to be the Ecclesia 24-7 in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah.